so good to see all of you. I love it. What a great crowd. This is incredible. I mean, I said at the last lecture, I think, you know, we're officially back, but man, I gotta say, I think this is really official. This is incredible. All right, so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Goodman. I'm the museum director at El Rancho de los Golondrinas Living History Museum. And welcome to the 2023 Winter Lecture Series, Speaking of Traditions. Uh, los Golondrinas has been putting on this lecture since 1999, making this the 25th year. We're happy to be partners with the New Mexico Museum of Art in presenting this lecture series. And, uh, and I always say it, I think we're in uh, you know, the premier venue here in Santa Fe, the St. Francis Auditorium. I think it's just beautiful. At this time, please remember to silence your cell phones. Any cell phones that go off, we're gonna keep and we're gonna use those to, ch you know, we'll download the program that we use to check you all in with your tickets. Um, that just goes into our pool. Vic keeps those in a milk crate in his office. Anyone can support both Golandrinus and the New Mexico Museum of Art by becoming members. Um, it makes a difference. It really goes a long way in supporting both of our organizations. So I encourage you to check out our respective websites. Um, you can also check in with uh, Amanda and Stephanie out front and get signed up for membership today as well. Uh, for those of you who are watching this broadcast uh, on the Golandrinus live sessions, uh, post any questions in the comments section and they will be answered. Be sure to check out uh, our website for details about our final lecture this year. Uh, on March 28th, we have Alan Carr, Los Alamos, Los Alamos Lab historian speaking on Manhattan Project spies. Ooh. Um, and I, so I expect to see all of you back for that lecture as well. Just buy your tickets now. Um, but tonight, we have Dr. Ron Duncan Hart. Dr. Hart is a cultural anthropologist from Indiana University with postdoctoral work at the University of Oxford. He's the director of the Institute for Tolerance Studies and a former university vice president and dean of academic affairs. He has awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, Ford Foundation, and Fulbright, among others. Hart has written books on crypto Jews, Jews in the Arab world, and Sephardic Jews. And he is a documentary filmmaker. In addition to appearing in PBS programs on Jewish life and culture, he's been an invited lecturer for universities and other organizations across the US, Europe, South America, and China. And tonight, Dr. Hart is speaking on New Mexico's hidden Jewish heritage. In Mexico and New Mexico, Jews had to hide their identity because of the death penalty for any Jew caught in Spanish territories. Of the thousands of Spanish conversos who migrated to Mexico to get away from Spain, some moved to New Mexico, the far northern edge of the Spanish empire and far from the Inquisition. They still had to hide their Jewish identity and even after the Spanish lost control and the Inquisition disappeared, the culture of hiding persisted for more than 100 years. In 1965, the Second Vatican Council repudiated anti-Semitism, opening relations with Jews. After that, descendants of Converso families in New Mexico began to be more open about their heritage. Over the last 50 years, the hidden Jewish heritage of New Mexico has been increasingly open and documented. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Ron Duncan Hart. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you today, and thank you, Daniel. And um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this winter lecture series with the Rancho de las Colondrinas, which um, it, I would like to say I consider a gem in the crown of the Santa Fe museums and cultural institutions. And as we go through the talk today, we'll actually see Las Colondrinas in, at one point. Um, I would also like to recognize and acknowledge the work of the people who have 
uh, been working in this area for the last 30 years or so. And uh, the one who stands out in New Mexico as being so important is Dr. Stanley Hordes, that some of you might know. Um, and we will talk about him briefly in, in the talk. Um, along with Stan Hordes, there were other people in the United States. Um, David Gitlitz started the work uh, even earlier, uh, mostly on the East Coast. Um, in New Mexico also, I would like to mention Isabel Medina Sandoval, who is a poet and novelist who has explored this tradition in her own family in uh, such excellent writing. So it's uh, given that basis, it uh, gives me a chance to uh, bring this, this information to you tonight. Um, I began, some people ask, how did you get involved in this? Um, my surnames are not Spanish, um, and so how did you get involved? We, for 20 years, my wife and I, Gloria, who's sitting halfway back there, uh, Gloria and I lived in Latin America, and we, for much of that time, we lived in Colombia. Colombia has one of the three locations of the Inquisition in the Americas, in Cartagena. The three locations are Mexico City, Cartagena, and Lima. Uh, in Cartagena, I began looking into this history. Uh, we went to Madrid, where the, the files of the Inquisition are. Uh, we're able to get access, go in and actually read files of people who had been arrested for Jewish practices by the Inquisition. Um, the first one we read was a, a, a file that came from very early on in the Inquisition, in the, in the late 1400s. And it was about a woman who was 80 years old. She was a midwife, and she'd been arrested by the Inquisition because she was washing the baptismal water off of babies after they were baptized. So she would, um, uh, they would uh, because they were baptized in the, in the first week or so, she would take them home, wash off the baptismal water, and keep them as, they formerly were Christians, but then they were actually keeping their Jewish heritage. The, as we sat in the, the reading room of the, um, the archive there in Madrid, I, I still remember the first day they brought out this file, and it's the origin, it was the original file from the late 1400s. A stack of paper like this, bound in a ribbon, uh, in parchment, handwritten, the entire trial of this woman, all of the questions, all of her answers. The, uh, it, it was a very moving experience. We've read many other files uh, after that of, of people from the Inquisition who had been arrested for this, um, but that's one I still remember vividly. The, in her case, she was 80 years old and she claimed uh, infirmity. She was not well and the Inquisition um, left her case in abeyance. So she was not convicted of everything. She was essentially told, uh, don't do it again, go home. Uh, if you do it again, you'll be in trouble, you know. Uh, and the, uh, so she was able to live out her life. Uh, that was not always the case with everyone in the, uh, that appeared before the Inquisition. So let's start looking at kind of how this system worked. The, we're gonna be talking about hidden Jews and their survivals. Um, uh, first of all, something on terminology. Uh, I'll be using the terms converso and also hidden Jew or crypto Jew. When, when uh, I use the term converso, what it means is simply someone who converted from their Jewish heritage to being Catholic or being Christian. Now, and uh, they actually, they kept fairly good records about who converted. Uh, so it's very interesting. There, there are actually books with lists of names of people who converted. Um, when people converted, they normally changed their name, by the way, from the Jewish name to a Christian name. And we'll see that in just a minute how some of that happened. So conversos were anybody who converted. Crypto Jews or hidden Jews were those who converted under pressure but kept their identity as being Jewish. 
and kept Jewish practices. So we'll keep that distinction. The, and this is important because we know who conversos were. Records were kept. We don't know who was a hidden Jew because they were hidden. They were doing this in secret. There's no record. Uh, we do have some records when they were arrested by the Inquisition. So that's the one kind of window we have into it. Um, and there are some other ways we can get information. But um, to know who was a hidden Jew is a much more difficult proposition. So as we look at this, um, you, uh, some people ask the question, well, how did this happen? How could people who converted three, 400 years ago, 500 years ago, how could it possibly be that their descendants today still have these practices or this memory? Well, the mechanism is culture. And when I say culture, I'm not referring to high culture like opera and uh, chamber music festival and uh, literature, but uh, we're talking about in chamber music, which is normally in this auditorium. Uh, the, but we're talking about everyday culture, the culture of everyday beliefs, practices, foods, uh, sayings, uh, way to relation to uh, relationships to other people. In that, in that mechanism, within this cultural mechanism, there it is possible, uh, we have documentation from various places, how survivals can occur over long periods of time, even when people are cut off from the original source of their culture. Um, there um, are examples, of, for example, from Japan. During the Tokugawa period, they outlawed Christian practice. So there, but there were secret Jewish groups, uh, uh, pardon me, secret Christian groups that survived into the 19th uh, century and 20th century. Um, so these, they survived in secret, it was outlawed, but it's parallel to what happened with Jews in the Christian world. Uh, we also have examples of, uh, we have many examples of Jewish hidden identity surviving. Um, a, a, a very well-known one that's been uh, getting some attention in, in the last uh, two or three years are the Kaifeng Jews from China, from Kaifeng. Uh, they were at the eastern end of the Silk Route. Jews, Jewish traders were on the Silk Route. There was a Jewish community in Kaifeng at one point. Uh, the Silk Route ended centuries back. Uh, but these people kept the tradition and still today uh, they're reclaiming and becoming more open about their claim of their uh, Jewish identity and their Jewish past. The, um, in in uh, many places where the Spanish uh, Empire existed and where the Inquisition e existed across Latin America, uh, we have many instances where groups are reappearing today in Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, and other places uh, reclaiming their Jewish heritage and their Jewish past. So it's, um, it's not only in New Mexico, but New Mexico is a, a particular example of this process. The, um, so we start in Spain, and the, uh, one of the things to have in mind is when uh, in Spain in the early part of the last millennium, when we're 1100s, 1200s, the Jewish population in Spain was the largest Jewish population in Europe. There were maybe a half million people, 400,000, 500,000, no census, so we don't have exact numbers, but uh, that's the best we can, uh, the information that we get from demography estimates. Now you might ask about, don't Jews come from Eastern Europe? What about Poland? Well, that developed after the 1500s. In the first half of this last millennium, the major Jewish population in Europe was in Spain. There was a smaller population in France, a little bit in England, but they were expelled in 1280. In France, they were expelled in the 1300s. Uh, in, in Spain, we have this larger population. But as the Christian militancy grew with the Crusades, starting in 1095 with Pope Urban, uh, then into the 1200s with especially with Pope Innocent III, the, the, this, this growing anti-Semitism 
uh, was becoming more important. And part of it started with the fact that the Crusades were against the infidels. So the idea was the infidel in the Holy Land to drive them out. And remember, the, the Muslims were still in Spain at this point, up until 1492. That, that's when the Muslims finally were driven out of Spain. Uh, so the Crusades went against Muslims in the Holy Land and Muslims in Spain. But while the Crusades were starting, the idea came up, the Crusaders, the idea began to develop. If we're fighting the infidel, the Muslims, there are infidels here in Europe, the Jews. So the Crusaders, literally on the first crusade, going down the Rhine Valley on their way to the Holy Land, began attacking Jewish communities. And this is really the first, uh, I, I believe it's the first one that I know of, where there were attacks on Jewish communities and, and thousands of people were killed. So the process was starting. But what we're going to find is, let me see if we get to the next one here. Um, in Spain, we, we start with this large population, maybe 400,000, 500,000. Um, the attacks in Spain really don't become major until the Black Death in the mid-1300s, 1348, 1350. Um, Jews were accused of poisoning the wells, and people thought it was Jews that were causing the Black Death. People didn't really know about the germs and the rats and China and all of that in the meantime. Um, that came later. There were attacks on Jews and the Jewish communities, and we began to get the process of conversion, of forced conversions. And we began to get Jews converting to Christianity. Very shortly after that, 1391, there was a major, major set of pogroms in Spain. And they, it happened all over Spain. It started in Seville. It gradually moved up to central Spain, then up to Barcelona. And in this process, thousands of people were uh, killed. Uh, Jane Gerber, who's the specialist on this, puts these numbers that you'll see here. She said 100,000 killed, 100,000 forced to convert, and 100,000 left Spain. Now, those numbers seem a little bit large to me, but she got the, the pattern right. Many tens of thousands, if not 100,000, were killed and were forced to convert and forced to leave. So we get the first big converso population here, people forced to convert under pressure of violence. Now, many, as I mentioned before, many times people converted, but they still kept their Jewish identity. And Maimonides, as you'll see here, was the one who had advocated, if your life is in danger, convert, feign conversion, and then leave the space as soon as you can and return to your Jewish life. So Maimonides had given the theological justification for doing this. And he actually did this in a letter he wrote to Spanish Jews, by the way. The, um, so all of this was happening before we get to 1492. Now in, in that year, finally 1492, we reached the point where everyone is, all the Jews are ordered to either leave Spain or convert. Again, we don't have exact numbers. Uh, the best estimates are that maybe there were 150,000 Jews left in Spain at that point. And the idea is that more than half, maybe two thirds, left Spain. Uh, people went into Morocco, into Italy, into France, which were also Catholic countries, but they were open to, to Jews. And um, uh, later on, many people went on into Amsterdam and other places. But while those people left, we know that there were some maybe 50 to 75,000 people who converted and stayed in Spain. Now, there would have already been some con converse, uh, con uh, conversos. So we begin to get a sizable population, 70,000, 80,000, maybe even 100,000 people who were conversos in Spain. We don't know how many of those were hidden Jews. 
a significant number was, but we don't know the number. The, um, if, we, if we estimate that all the conversos were hidden Jews, if they were all hidden Jews, um, the, the total population of Spain at this point was seven million. So if there were 70,000 hidden Jews, that would have been 1% of the Spanish population. So we're not talking about huge numbers percentage-wise, but we're still talking about tens of thousands of people. And um, one of these, a famous story that comes out of this is Rabbi Salomon Halevi in Burgos. He was the rabbi there. In, in the, the riots of 1391, the pogroms, he was confronted with the being attacked and maybe killed, and he chose to convert in the process. Um, he not only converted, but he, he, he was not a hidden Jew. He converted to be a real Christian. Um, his sons also converted. Now, one of the things that happened in these in families, you, you frequently would have the thing that a family would divide at this point. Some would convert, some would not. His wife did not convert, which is very interesting. So in the process, their marriage was annulled, um, or there was a divorce of some sort. Uh, he became a priest in the Catholic Church. Um, rabbis were valued to go into the church because they were highly educated. They knew Hebrew, um, and they were valued to incorporate into the church. He not only became a priest, but eventually became the Bishop of Burgos. He was the highest church official in Burgos. In that position, he, the king died. Uh, the son that was left was under age, could not be king. The Bishop of Burgos, Pablo de Santa Maria, now because that's his new Christian name, became the regent. So he is in, essentially was acting as the king of the kingdom at this point. Uh, and he was, uh, his leadership was so highly valued that he was even considered to be Pope. Now, he didn't, he was never elected Pope, but he was a candidate. So you see, um, people who converted, especially uh, high-placed Jewish people like a rabbi, were rewarded within the system and uh, could move into high positions of authority. Um, as happened in this case. Now, one of the things that I would like to point out at this, uh, to keep in mind also, um, this is the Santa Maria family. Um, they intermarried with the Carvajal family. The Santa Marias tend to, went into, tend to go into the church. Um, they even went into the Inquisition. The Carvajals tended to be hidden Jews, and we're gonna find them later in Mexico what happens when these two branches of the family come together uh, in, in that part of the world. And if you excuse me just a minute, I'm gonna have something to keep my voice working in this process. And uh, the, uh, so this is an example, Pablo Santa Maria uh, takes uh, this Christian name that I mentioned before, which was a common practice uh, among people who were converting. Okay, we come to the Inqu Inquisition. <coughs> the, the Inquisition was established in 1480, and uh, the Spanish Inquisition was different from a normal Inquisition. Usually an, Inquisi an Inquisition functioned kind of like a grand jury, if you can use that model. Uh, it was the, uh, an Inquisition could be called by any bishop or any church official in the local town to make inquiries about anti-Catholic behavior. Now, the Spanish Inquisition was actually set up by the Spanish crown. It was not the church. Now, they had to get a special dispensation from the church, which the Pope gave them, but they set it up as a Spanish crown institution. Now, the, um, they asked the Dominican order to run the Inquisition for them. So Dominican priests were the inquisitors. They ran the Inquisition. 
but it was for the Spanish crown. And uh, the distinction to be made that's important here is that the, the inquisitors, the Dominicans, could sentence a person to death, but the church never actually put anybody to death. They never burned anybody at the stake. When a person was sentenced to be burned at the stake, they turned them over to the crown officials, essentially the sheriff of the county. The sheriff of the county would take them and burn them at the stake. But the, 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 the Dominican order did the death sentence. So um, in, and in between 1480 and 1530, those first 50 years, the estimates are that 20,000 people in Spain were arrested by the Inquisition and something in the order of two or 3,000 were actually burned at the stake. So we have tens of thousands of people being arrested by the Inquisition for suspicion of Jewish practice and we have thousands being burned at the stake. Now this is out of a population, remember, the, that uh, could be 70, 80,000 people. Um, so part of what happened here was that if you were a converso family living in Spain and you saw this going on, uh, essentially if 20,000 people were arrested, that means one out of every four, one out of every five conversos were being arrested. This was a very high percentage. Uh, people, took, I mean, they saw that immediately and the conversos began leaving Spain by tens of thousands. By the time we get to the end of the 1600s, what we find is the Inquisition is no longer arresting crypto Jews in any kind of significant number. It, just, it drops off the cliff, in a sense, that first 100 years. Now, there are two things that were happening here. One, uh, uh, conversos, hidden Jewish families, were leaving Spain in large numbers. Uh, the, the Ottoman Empire was recruiting people uh, actively. And there was a, a very famous woman, um, converso, uh, hidden Jewish, crypto Jewish woman, whose name was Doña Gracia Nasi, who was the heir to a very wealthy family of uh, ship owners and international merchants. She began using her ships to take converso populations, uh, hundreds of people at a time, to the Ottoman Empire where they were welcomed. And this built that uh, the very large Sephardic population that grew up in Salonika and Rhodes and in the Balkans, uh, it was a part of this process. The, now the other thing that happened in the 1500s, if um, you remember, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 99 theses to the wall, to the, the door of the Wittenberg church. Okay, so the Protestant Reformation began to be a major factor. And the actual fact was that the Inquisition began to pay more attention to the Protestants because they were the real threat. Jews became less of a threat. So by the time we get to the 1600s, um, and uh, one of the things that I, I say to my Protestant friends, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for what happened to you in this process because the Inquisition really started looking for the Protestants, and, but they began to ignore the Jews, uh, whoever was left there. Uh, so that is part of the dynamic historically that went on. So people were leaving Spain in large numbers and um, the, they were going to the, the Ottoman Empire that I mentioned, Morocco. Uh, many people went to Amsterdam and the country that was actively recruiting Jews at this point was Poland. And we get, it's very interesting that the, uh, the Eastern European Jewish population it, when the 1400s was about 25,000 people, the estimates are. By the time we get to the end of the 1500s, that's well over 150,000 people. It had grown dramatically. So a lot of people coming out of Spain, wherever they were expelled, were going to Poland, where they were being welcomed, and we get this big shift of population from Western Europe into Eastern Europe, and it changed the nature of Jewish life in Europe. Uh, people also migrated to the Americas, and that's the strand that we're going to follow. And um, we will see in Mexico, it, it was prohibited to be a converso 
uh, not even hidden do, but anybody who was a converso was prohibited by law from coming to the Americas. Now the reason for that, the argument was that the Americas is not a safe place for anyone who's not an old, secure Christian. Because in the Americas, you had African slaves who were doing African things. Uh, you had Native Americans who were doing Native American rituals. Uh, it was not a Christian place yet. So anyone who was a converso, whose Christianity was in question, was prohibited from going to the Americas. But as you know, when laws are made, you can build a 20 foot wall and somebody will build a 25 foot ladder. Uh, and there were ways of getting around this law. Um, and there was a profession that developed in Seville, which was the, the, the city, the port of exit for people. And this profession was called the linojudo. It was essentially a genealogist that prepared special little booklets that people had to carry at this time, which were booklets that were called the limpieza de sangre booklets. Clean blood, limpieza de sangre, clean blood. Um, you had to prove that you had no Jewish blood or no Muslim blood uh, to be able to, to get into certain positions in government um, and receive certain awards or to migrate to the Americas. Well, so the Lino Hudo, if with, with the proper payment, the Lino Hudo could trim the undesired branches off of your family tree and give you a clean family tree which said you were an old Christian family and you were safe. Um, if, uh, if you were at the 2016 exhibit in the History Museum that was on Fractured Faiths, we actually had examples of some of those booklets there, uh, which uh, uh, the ones we had were from wealthy families and they were beautifully made, but the ordinary ones for normal people were, were small little passport type booklets um, that proved the limpieza uh, sangre of your family. So, so you could get to the Americas. We know that from the very beginning with Cortez in 1520, we know there were conversos there, uh, hidden Jews, uh, because four of them were, were recognized for Jewish practice and they were executed. Now we don't know how many more hidden Jews or conversos were in Cortez expedition uh, because they were probably better at hiding their Jewish practice, but there were four of them at least that were caught and were executed. So we know that there were hidden Jews even from 1520 with Cortez. You'll see these numbers of the arrest by the Inquisition in Mexico over the next hundred years. And you'll see the numbers are small. In, in Spain, we're talking about tens of thousands. Here, we're talking about hundreds. Okay, but the difference is there were fewer hidden Jews in the Americas. There's, you know, in Spain, there were maybe 80, maybe 100,000 conversos. By making the, the estimate, I've tried to do the demi, uh, demography on this, and the, you know, the, the choice is, let's see, I think I lost my pointer here. Uh, here we go. The, uh, you see this number here at the bottom, 5,000. Mm, we don't know how many conversos or hidden Jews there were, but uh, we know that there were 250,000 Spaniards in Mexico by the time we get into 1600s. So if we take an estimate of that, 1% uh, of those would have been 2,500. If let's, let's say there were more conversos coming to the Americas to get away from the Inquisition in, in Spain, let's say the number was higher than the percentage in Spain. 2% would have been 5,000. Uh, if we move it up to 5%, uh, we're, we're getting you know, a few more thousand people. Uh, we don't know the exact number, but we know it's something in the thousands. The, um, <coughs> so we're looking at, uh, in the, the most famous family in Mexico are the Carvajals. Um, this is like the, the, the hidden Jewish nobility uh, family. <coughs> and you remember I mentioned before the Santa Marias and the Carvajals had intermarried. They were both conversos. The Santa Marias went the church side. Uh, the Carvajals kept their hidden Jewish direction. And here we find them again. Uh, Luis de Carvajal uh, de la Cueva 
was named the governor of the province of Nuevo Leon, which is here, northeastern Mexico, around what is today Monterrey. And uh, he was granted, he was given the land grant of Nuevo Leon. <coughs> the way the things worked in the Spanish conquest of the Americas, they would give land grants to wealthy, powerful people who then had to create their own army to actually settle or conquer that region. The Spanish never sent an army to conquer anything in the Americas. It was conquered through these land grant things. Uh, he got the land grant for Nuevo Leon. He had to provide his own army. He had to give them horses, armor, guns, the whole business. So you had to have someone wealthy enough to get a private army. And he was given permission to bring 100 men for his army, and he, they could bring their families. And one of the significant things is that the king waived the requirement of the limpieza de sangre. So they waived the requirement of having to prove that they had no Jewish blood. And so what happened was the governor happened to have a sister, Francisca, who was recruited to come, who was a hidden Jew and her family. Now, you might say, what about the governor? I mean, if his sister is a hidden Jew, what about him? But remember, these, the family's divided. And uh, he was able to hide his converso background. She was a converso, but they were actively Judaizing, doing Jewish practices. And um, the, so, so she, was brought, she was recruited along with other families that were uh, familiar with them. So uh, crypto-Jewish families tended to uh, exist in clusters. So there would have been other families that came in the cluster of Francisca as the sister of the governor. Um, she came with her, her son, Luis, who was named after the uncle, the governor, and then the daughters that you'll see here, Isabel, Leonor, Catalina, Mariana. We have all these details because it's, it's all in the Inquisition records. And we have ample information about this family. We don't know how many conversal families there were um, that came uh, into this Monterey area, uh, but we know there were a number of them. And people in Monterey today still trace their roots back to those families, and, there, and in Monterey there is another cluster of people who are identifying with their Jewish heritage and have become more uh, public about it in recent years. Okay, so Luis de Carvajal, the nephew, um, as was common, in the, the practice of uh, hidden Jews, the family did not tell children about the hidden Jewish background until they were old enough to keep the secret. So usually uh, girls maybe were told when they were 13 or 14 or 15, something like that, boys a little bit older, maybe 16 or 17. Uh, and we don't know the exact age when Luis was told, but he was probably 16, 17, 18 in that range. The, um, when he learned about the family Jewish heritage, he became passionate about returning to Judaism. Now, it was not, Bibles were not commonly available to people at that time because the church thought there was too much um, unusual stuff in the Bibles for common people to be reading. So it needed to be filtered through the priest. The priest could interpret it. So common people didn't have the Bible. Luis was able to get sections of the Old Testament. He apparently got essentially the five books of Moses in Latin. And he began reading it. And he found out early on the covenant between Jews and God was recognized by the circumcision of the male. So he promptly self-circumcised. That was the beginning of his practice. Um, he then began to encourage other young men that he knew that they should be circumcised and began encouraging people to observe the holidays, uh, to observe Shabbat, and he, and his, he was uh, very active and open in this process. So this became, became to the attention of the Inquisition fairly quickly, of course. In 1590, he was arrested. Uh, the uncle was also arrested, the governor of the province. Um, Francisca and the daughters were all arrested. The uncle died in the Inquisition jail, but Luis, the nephew, the mother and the sisters 
were sentenced to five years confinement in a monastery. Now there were inquisition jails, but in this case, they, they, they ordered their confinement in a monastery. So over the next five years, they were exposed to Christian teachings and continually encouraged to deny, to denounce their Jewish practices and return to full Christian practice. Um, the thing that we know at this time, you see him here, he's, he's shown with uh, the, 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 uh, the feather of the pluma and he's writing and he wrote the, the most complete treatise that we have stating the beliefs of hidden Jews. It's, it's a very valuable document. Um, there, if, if you'd like to read more about Luis de Carvajal, the University of New Mexico Press has published a book called The Martyr, which gets into uh, much of this information. So we, um, this is a retablo made by Charlie Carrillo, who is a Santa Fe based retablo painter. Um, and the retablos were small works of art, either on pieces of wood or leather or tin, something like this, that, that would show um, biblical figures. They were supposed to show Christian figures. But one of the things that happens um, in the hidden Jewish tradition, apparently there were also figures of Moses, Esther, and Job, who are the three main biblical characters in the hidden Jewish tradition. Uh, they were biblical figures, so they could be kept. They weren't uh, questioned in that sense. And, uh, but the Catholic Church was opposed to these figures because they said they were not legitimate Catholic imagery like was, that was in the churches, because the approved imagery was in the church. And these were street images uh, that they were, were not approving of, but they existed and they were popular. The Carvajal family, um, they were released in, in 1595. They immediately went back to their Jewish practices. They were rearrested by the Inquisition in 1596. And on the second uh, trial, they were, as happened with the Inquisition, um, they were, if, if, if you got a second, or sometimes if, if it was not too bad, you might get a third trial. But usually a second trial meant that you got the worst punishment and their punishment was to be burned at the stake. Now, the, uh, I mentioned, you know, I mentioned before the Santa Maria side of the family. The, the person in the Inquisition who signed the death certificates for the Carvajals was a cousin on the Santa Maria side of the family. It was a cousin who signed the death certificates for them. Uh, this was a, a, a research that Roger Martinez uh, recently discovered in some of his research in Spain. The, um, the other thing that happened here, the, uh, during the time that they had been in the monastery, the, the priests who had been discussing and trying to convince them to, re to return to full Christian practice, uh, their reports say that they were so impressed with Luis Carvajal, the, the nephew, um, that he was, a, he, was a, he was very good at arguing and discussing theology with them. He was knowledgeable. And in this process, by the way, he changed his name from Luis de Carvajal to Joseph Lumbroso. Very interesting. Joseph from the Old Testament, the story of Joseph. So Joseph, the dreamer, the, the, the foreseer, he could see the future. And Lumbroso, which in Spanish means like the enlightened one. So he became Joseph the dreamer, the enlightened one by self-choice and his name change. Uh, a very, very interesting character. Uh, and his, his book gives us the best statement of what the understanding of Jewish, uh, hidden Jewish uh, life was. Okay, at this time, in the in about the 1600, early 1600s, in Mexico, we, we don't know exactly how many hidden Jews there were. Uh, you know, I put up this figure of 5,000. Uh, it might have been 10,000. We're not sure, but it's in the thousands. We do know that there were clusters. Uh, the, Jew the hidden Jewish families tended to form clusters, and, and they would intermarry, and they would meet. And they were the, usually the most important, the wealthiest, or the, like the leader in the group, would be the head of this cluster. 
uh, we know that there were clusters in these cities. Mexico City, of course, the, the, the big city, the capital. Um, Veracruz and, and Acapulco are important because they're the two port cities and Jews were always involved in maritime trade. Jews were always coming in and out of the ports. And we, we get a statement in the 1700s from the leaders in Veracruz saying, we can't deal with this anymore, they're Jews, everybody can't stop them, uh, and it's because of the maritime trade thing. The um, Zacatecas was a major mining center, and Jews regularly throughout South America were involved in supplying goods to miners. Not unlike Levi Strauss supplying blue jeans to the California miners in our own tradition, you know. So, the, so 1596, the Carvajal family were burned at the stake. Now this is the family of a governor of a province, one of the wealthiest men in Mexico, a major powerful family. If a powerful family could be arrested by the Inquisition and burned at the stake, <clears throat> if um, at the same time, 15, uh, 1596, Oñate had been approved to make his expedition to Nuevo, Me uh, Nuevo Mexico, to New Mexico. And the 1598, they actually made the expedition up here. So I've, I've thought about this many times. If I had been a hidden Jew in Mexico City in 1596, 1597, I think I would have signed up for uh, Oñate's expedition to get out of Mexico and get as far from the Inquisition as I could. And we know that there were people who were hidden Jewish families on that expedition. Now, I can't give you their names. Uh, they were hidden Jews. Uh, but we know from later documentation that there were people on that expedition who were hidden Jews. The, there was no uh, Inquisition office in Santa Fe, so it was relatively safe. Um, the 1,200 miles from Mexico City to Santa Fe was a long trip. You had to walk, or if you were lucky, you might have a horse. Um, it was not an easy trip. Uh, significant sections of that trip in northern Mexico and southern New Mexico were crossing desert areas that were very difficult to cross. Uh, you might be familiar with the section in southern Mexico that's called the Jornado de la, de, de, de la Muerte, the, 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 journey, the path of death uh, because of the lack of water through that section. Uh, so th this was not an easy journey. Later on, when the, when the roads were established, the pathways were established, it still took four months to be able to travel from Santa Fe to Mexico City. So it was, being that distance was some security. They arrived here, of course, and what they found was the adobe architecture that we know. Um, people tended to settle in the mountain valleys, not in Santa Fe itself, but in the smaller towns in, in the northern uh, mountain valleys, um, and they would have attended churches like this one in Las Trampas, which is a colonial adobe church, which is still there. They, um, the famous case of someone being arrested by the Inquisition, uh, they were arrested here in the Palacio, uh, the, the Palace of the Governors, was Doña Teresa Aguilera y Roche. Now, she was arrested her husband was also arrested at the same time. He is the former governor of the territory. His name was Don Bernardo Mendezabal. And uh, they were both arrested and sent to Mexico, to the Inquisition. Uh, he was arrested, it seems his arrest was probably more political because he fought with the church all the time. And it seems that a priest reported him as being uh, a Jewish uh, practitioner although it looks maybe he wasn't, maybe it was just a, a political thing to get him out of Santa Fe. Um, but Doña Teresa w actually had specific accusations against her. One of them was that she changed clothes for the weekend. She put on fresh clothes. She bathed and put on fresh clothes on Friday, getting ready for the weekend. She would change the bedding. And that's something that a Christian wouldn't do who changed their clothes and bathed and changed the bedding and cleaned the house on Friday before a weekend? Jews and Muslims. Uh, that was a practice at the time. 
Uh, if, if you read the history, you know that uh, because of the, the humoral theory of health, which was the, 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 the difference between hot and cold and dry and wet, uh, people thought that contrasts could create ill health. So if you were taking a bath in the winter, it was not good for you. It could make you sick. Uh, and people would avoid uh, that normally. But here was a person who was regularly doing it. So they thought, okay, that must be, she must be Jewish because she's bathing once a week. Uh, the other thing, she was also accused of being Jewish because she drank chocolate on Good Friday. Now, Good Friday is supposed to be a time of, that's austere. You're either fasting or, or being austere. And she was indulging in a pleasure of drinking chocolate on Good Friday. A good Christian wouldn't do that. She must be Jewish. The third accusation against her was she read books in foreign languages and she would laugh when she was reading the books. Okay, the thing was that Doña Teresa was the daughter of a Spanish diplomat. She actually grew up in Italy and in France. She knew Italian and French and she was reading um, so the idea was you should read, if you're reading, you should be reading religious books, like, like something that was uh, about uh, faith or something like that, and you wouldn't laugh if you're reading that. She was probably reading some of the early novels and laughing about them in these foreign languages. <clears throat> the, an, another thing about this that's interesting is Spanish was considered the Christian language, not Latin, but Spanish. And... Um, in Latin America, uh, uh, we spent 20 years in Latin America. I'm an anthropologist. A lot of time out in small towns and, and rural areas. And the people there today still say, today, hablo cristiano, when they're talking about their language. I speak Christian. They don't say hablo, in, in the city, an educated person will say hablo castellano. But in the countryside, uneducated, less educated people say hablo cristiano, I speak Christian. Spanish was the Christian language. If you're reading in a foreign language, you must be reading something that's not Christian. So you must be Jewish. So these were the accusations made against her. Um, she defended herself at the Inquisition. Uh, she did, she had an elaborate defense, uh, which we have a copy of. And by the way, Fran Levine, who used to be the director of the History Museum, has done the book on Doña Teresa and her defense before the Inquisition. And if you'd like to read further, that could be an interesting read for you. So from in 1680 to 1670, things, or 1700, things changed dramatically. The, uh, the Pompeii Revolt um, killed many of the priests and many of the Spanish settlers who drove them out. Um, it essentially broke the Inquisition and the church's power because when De Vargas came back in, one of the concessions they had to make was they would not rule in the same way that they had before. And the, the power to enslave uh, Indian people to do work for building churches or whatever was no longer permitted. Um, another thing that happened that was key here was in 1700, the, the last of the Habsburgs died, Habsburg kings died without heir and the Bourbon dynasty was brought in from Spain to, uh, and from France to rule Spain. The Bourbons were more liberal. They didn't like the Inquisition. They essentially cut the power of the Inquisition, cut its funding, and after 1700, the Inquisition does not have the power that it had before. There were only two arrests in Mexico by the Inquisition for Judaizing in the 1700s. So it becomes essentially a non-factor after that. So in the 1700s and 1800s, uh, we, you can visit Las Colondrinas and see what life would have been like in that period by a, a well-to-do family. And um, the, some of the practices that we know that were continuing during this period, and we, 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 we know they existed because we have reports of them being brought out and made public in the 1900s, in recent decades. Um, the most important one centered around Shabbat, and this seems to have been the practice that was most common among hidden Jews, observing Shabbat on, on, uh, on uh, the Sabbath, on Saturday. So the Friday activities were to clean the house, 
take the bath, change the clothes, change the bedding, uh, light candles on Friday night. All of these things are reported from hidden Jewish families in New Mexico coming out of this period. Uh, the centrality of Moses, Esther, and Job, again, that we've seen. Uh, death rituals. Uh, sand would be rubbed on the feet of people before they were buried for their, as they passed through the Holy Land on their way to the next life. Uh, that was not a normal Christian practice. Uh, mirrors would be covered, for example. Uh, diet, dietary laws, people would not eat pork. Um, circumcision, um, although it seems that that would be something that would be easily recognized by the Inquisition, but in Mexico, Inquisition records show that 80% of the men arrested for Judaizing in Mexico were in fact circumcised. So this seems to have been a very common practice that was maintained. And uh, the people remembered and observed holidays also in this process. So Moses, Esther, and Job. Moses became, in a sense, like the equivalent of Jesus. And he became a, the Saint Moses was his name. People would pray to him, asking for help. Esther was a hidden Jew. And uh, the, the celebration of Saint Esther, uh, which is going to be next week, uh, still is practiced today. And it, uh, it coincides with Purim in the Jewish practice. And Job, because he, he was the hidden Jewish equivalent of the suffering of Jesus. He was the suffering one. The, there, there was a tradition of anti-clericalism, and um, let me go on to the next one, uh, because we'll pick that up here. Uh, when the Americans arrived in 1846, um, the, the thing that happened at the same time was Protestants began to arrive. And we have a thing happening where there were a number of families that began to convert to Protestantism. And those families tended to, as we find today, uh, families that are now reclaiming their Jewish heritage, many of those families had been Protestants before coming out openly about their Jewish heritage. So it looks like there was this, this tradition that was anti-clericalism, where people wanted to leave the Catholic Church, they joined the Protestant Church, and now many of those are coming out claiming their Jewish identity and the return to Judaism. Um, New Mexico had 60,000 people in 1850. How many hidden Jews would there have been? Um, again, we have, to, we have to make estimates. Um, if we're talking about 5%, then 3,000 hidden Jews, maybe 500, 700 families. 10% would double those numbers. Uh, so we're talking about people in the, the uh, tens of thousands. Um, also, the other thing that happened here was uh, German Jews began to arrive, and we began to see Jewish practices come into the open then in the late 1800s and 1900s. Uh, the dreidel uh, and the Hebrew on gravestones begins to appear in northern New Mexico. The, another key factor that happens with the, the opening up, why did people begin to reclaim Jewish identity and practice? It happened, and it started happening about in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, in that time period. And the suggestions are, one was the Second Vatican Council was the one that said Jews were not uh, responsible for the death of Jesus. So get that off of the Jewish record, you know. Um, the other big thing that seems to have been a, a factor was the miniseries in Roots. And that encouraged people to start looking for their own ethnic roots. Um, Stan Hordes in the 1980s comes in as a state historian. And he began to have people come to him and tell him about lighting candles on Friday night, about the Jewish practices in their families. In 1992, uh, there was a big shift of emphasis on things that had happened around the expulsion. And there were writings about the hidden Jewish phenomenon. Uh, and the, the really, the first modern era book that we have is 1996, David Gitlitz, who writes Secrecy and, Def and Deceit, uh, The Religion of Crypto-Jews. Uh, 2005, we get Stan Hordes with his groundbreaking book, 
2009, we get Gary Hertz uh, with her book on New Mexico's crypto Jews. So these are the first publications that we begin having that tell about this life in, the, uh, in um, uh, New Mexico. There were people who questioned whether this really happened. Uh, Thomas, uh, Tomas Atencio uh, says that uh, this was really fused into the other uh, normal life and that it didn't actually exist today, it was part of histo history. Uh, Judith Newlander made the same argument. And we have an interesting person here, you might recognize that last name. Ben Sion Netanyahu is the father of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. Ben Sion was a historian. Uh, he believed that there were never hidden Jews. He thought it was an invention of the church, uh, that it was used as a way to be able to crack down on Jews. The, um, these are some of the people who have been uh, leading the process of returning to Jewish identity today. Um, another a big part of this has been the fact of the internet. Um, so much of the information, we had the scholarly books that came out, but once the internet came out in the mid-1990s and then on into the 2000s, a lot of information was available there and people began to be able to research and get this information. The, um, um, the, uh, this was a, a short video of someone actually talking about their return experience. If you'd like to read further in this area, I can recommend these books. Um, Halapid, uh, Guardians of a Hidden Tradition, which is Isabel Medina Sandoval, Stan Horty's book, and of course, I cannot leave out my book, which is on there. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. And um, we're right at our end time. So I don't know, do we have a chance for, for a question or? Okay, we can, we can take one or two questions. Um, this, um, so I don't know if there's any immediate question that anyone has, be glad to entertain it. If not, okay, yes. Uh, I can't hear. What happened to Doña Teresa? Doña Teresa, yes, the question is what happened to Doña Teresa? And uh, her trial was left suspended. Uh, she was not convicted, but they, they could not, they, apparently there was more evidence that they could not uh, release her. So her, her trial was simply suspended. So it was left open so that she could never come back again to, before the Inquisition or it would have been worse for her, yeah. Yes. Okay, why, do, why were the uh, Christians in Spain treating them differently than, than in France and, and Germany? And well, uh, in England, which were the other population. Remember, they were expelled from England in 1280, and they were not admitted back until the 1600s with Cromwell. Uh, in France, they were uh, again expelled in the 1300s. Uh, they were allowed back later, but uh, th there, there was this problem of expulsions. The, I think that, that what was different in Spain was the, what, what's called the Reconquista. Because remember, Spain was occupied by the Muslims for almost 800 years. And there was this tradition of the Christians fighting against the Muslims, fighting against the infidels in Spain, which didn't happen in the rest of Europe. So there was a particular kind of Christianity that developed there that was a militant Christianity that didn't exist in France or Italy or England. So, so I thank you very much for your attention and uh, it's been a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, if there are further questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to follow up with it out in the foyer and uh, I'll be there afterwards. Thank you for being here and I'd like to thank Rancho de las Colombinas. Yeah.
I was brought up Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. I went to Jesuit High School, my graduate of Jesuit High School in 1969. And I just had this yearning and I, I wanted to reconnect. And, and Rabbi Lean is the one that opened the door. I, if I had known there was an open door, I would have made it. I would have opened the door a long time. A long time before. Yeah. And then you learn Hebrew. Well, I, I've been studying it. I, I just, I'm drawn to it. I mean, I'm, I'm drawn to it. And when I came here, I just, I connected to the, the Hebrew. It's, I feel it in my heart and 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 it's a it's a it's a phonetic language it's like spanish mm -hmm. it's like it's yes, just like it's spanish, spanish. Yeah. so uh, so so I, I it's just something that i can i, I can adapt to very easily yeah. Yeah, because it's wonderful to hear your reading <laughs> thank you <laughs> no. thank you so it just was a natural thing and i and i and i would go to church and i'd hear them saying what jesus said and i didn't believe it I didn't believe he said those things. I just, I couldn't, I didn't connect with it. I started to lose it very fast. And, and, and then when I started listening to Rabbi Leon, it, and I didn't, I, it was the only one that made me know that there was a door that I could open was Rabbi Leon. Yeah, Rabbi Leon is somebody so important. Yes, he is. So important in the community. I mean, he has done yeah. so much. Yes, he has. He has, and I agree with him that uh, we're the future. Here in this community, there's still a, there is a dichotomy. Uh, I think that there's a lot of people that are hesitant about, about us, but um, they're learning to accept us. It's me. It's ready. Thank you. Did you put your first right? Yeah. I think they had the real. Thank you.